Ah, so following the shadows have led you right back to me. In today's tale, a group of people find out you should never take the old for granted. After all, they've been here a lot longer than we have. The air in Norfolk, England hung heavy with an eerie stillness as Mr. Bella, the enigmatic old man, prepared for his weekly journey to the local shop. The townsfolk whispered tales of his peculiar habits, his reclusive nature, and a decaying estate he called home. The house itself, nestled within a small farm estate, loomed in the shadows like a relic from a bygone era. Its windows, cracked and stained, revealed nothing of the secrets that lay within. Thickets of overgrown vegetation, clawed at the decaying structure, casted long, ominous shadows in the pale moonlight. On this particular day, when the sun had long since dipped below the horizon and darkness wrapped the land in an inky embrace, Mr. Bella embarked on his customary trip to the local store. The townspeople, aware of his routine, paid little attention to the aged figure hobbling down the cobblestone path. The quaint town of Norfolk slept soundly, oblivious to the unseen malevolence that stirred beneath its surface. Only the faint rustle of leaves and a distant howl of a lonely wind dared to break the silence. The night was pregnant with an unsettling anticipation, a prelude to the malevolent force that had chosen this night to reveal itself. Mr. Bella's footsteps echoed through the empty streets as he approached the old store. The flickering lamplights cast grotesque shadows, distorting the familiar surroundings into a spectral landscape. The townsfolk, wrapped in blissful slumber, were oblivious to the ominous air that had settled over the quiet abode. As Mr. Bella pushed open the creaking door of the store, a cold gust of wind swept through, sending a shiver down the spine of the occupants. The dim interior was lit by a solitary bulb that dangled precariously from the ceiling. Shelves lined with dusty products stood like silent sentinels, witnesses to countless mundane transactions. The shopkeeper, an elderly man with tired eyes and a perpetual frown, greeted Mr. Bella with a nod. Back again, Mr. Bella. Your usual, I presume? Mr. Bella nodded in return, his pale eyes devoid of emotion. He moved with a deliberate slowness, each step calculated and measured. The townsfolk had long speculated about his age, for he seemed to have walked the earth for an eternity, a relic of a forgotten era. As the shopkeeper gathered Mr. Bella's supplies, the atmosphere inside the store grew tense. A hushed whisper seemed to emanate from the shadows, an otherworldly presence that raised the hairs on the back of everybody's neck. The air crackled with an electric energy, an invisible force that defied reason. Close to the small town in Norfolk, the city of Norwich hosted a yearly event that drew visitors from far and wide, transforming the usually quiet streets into a bustling spectacle. A procession of cars wound its way towards the small town, filled with event-goers eager to experience the rural charm. Among the visitors were a group of boisterous city dwellers from London, their sense of entitlement evident in the way they carried themselves. The small local shop in Norfolk became an unintended pit stop for these urban intruders. Pushing their way to the front of the store, they demanded alcohol, cigarettes and snacks, treating the local storekeeper with disdain. Hold on there, shouted the storekeeper his voice breaking the silence that had settled after Mr. Bella's enigmatic entrance. The Londoners, fueled by arrogance, ignored him and attempted to leave without paying. Watch where you're going, old grandad. One of the thugs sneered as he accidentally bumped into Mr. Bella. To their surprise, he stood still, unmoved like a statue, his intent gaze fixed on them 
sending a chill down their spines. What are you looking at, old man? One of the thugs jeered, dismissing Mr. Bella's eerie silence as inconsequential. Insects, whispered Mr. Bella, his voice barely audible, but laced with an unsettling undertone. The thugs exchanged bemused glances, unsure of how to interpret the cryptic response. One of the more aggressive thugs approached Mr. Bella, taunting him. What did you say, old man? Attempting to assert his dominance, he tried to push Mr. Bella, but the frail figure remained unyielding, as if rooted to the spot. What the? The thug's sentence was cut short as Mr. Bella swiftly caught his incoming punch. A bone-crunching sound echoed through the silent store as the thug's arm twisted unnaturally, snapped by the iron grip of the seemingly feeble old man. The thug's laughter turned to shock and panic rippled through their faces. One of them, desperate to save face, pulled out a knife and charged at Mr. Bella. Now we're going to have a short scare break while you ease your nerves. So while you're waiting, don't forget, if you're enjoying the content, go ahead and stab that subscribe button right now. As doing so, you'll really help the professor spread his shadow of evil. Now, let's get back to the story. The blade found its mark, or so it seemed, as the old man's stomach should have yielded the sharp edge. However, to the horror of the thugs, no blood stained the blade, and Mr. Bella's expression remained unchanged. With an almost casual motion, Mr. Bella slapped the thug, sending him flying across the store. The others stared in disbelief at the frail figure that had effortlessly subdued their comrades. The air crackled with an otherworldly energy as the old man, seemingly impervious to harm, stood as a harbinger of the darkness. The dimly lit store echoed with the groans of the injured thug on the floor, his comrades struggling to comprehend the supernatural strength displayed by the seemingly frail Mr. Bella. The air crackled with tension as another thug cautiously approached, a glimmer of fear in his eyes. Careful, old man. You don't know who you're dealing with, the thug warned, a hint of uncertainty tainting his bravado. Mr. Bella, however, remained calm, his pale eyes gleaming with an otherworldly knowledge. The pleasure is all yours, Mr. Bella replied with a cryptic smile. The thug launched a kick at him, a desperate attempt to assert dominance. To their collective astonishment, the kick connected, but the man crumpled on the floor in agony, his shin fractured, the impact akin to kicking a concrete post. The others, realizing the futility of their bravado, hastily dragged their injured comrade out of the store, shooting defiant threats over their shoulders. We'll be back for you, old man. You don't know who we are. As the thugs retreated into the night, the storekeeper approached Mr. Bella cautiously. Are you okay, Mr. Bella? You'd better be careful people like that lose face with this type of thing. Next thing you know, there's more of them on your doorstep. In that case, I may not need my regular supply of raw meat for a few weeks, maybe months. Mr. Bella remarked, his tone carrying a dark humour. The storekeeper couldn't help but shudder at the implication of Mr. Bella's words. A realisation dawning that the old man's peculiar habits might be more than just eccentricities. In the shadows of time, Mr. Bella's origins reach back to the fateful year of 1066. The air was thick with an acrid scent of battle as he crossed the channel from France to England. Stepping into his first confrontation, the clash of swords, the screams of the wounded, and the stench of impending death surrounded him. It was in the midst of this chaos that Mr. Bella met his first adversary. A morning star swung with lethal intent. The brutal blow struck him on the head, leaving him bleeding and on the brink of death. As life ebbed away, someone or something 
intervened, dragging him from the battlefield's edge. Barely clinging to consciousness, Mr. Bella felt the chilling touch of fangs on his neck, a mysterious figure drawn by the scent of his fresh blood begun to feast upon him. In the thrones of near death, a spear pierced through the chest of the blood drinker, severing the unholy connection. Mr. Bella's wounds miraculously healed in the following days, but the encounter left an indelible mark on his existence. From that moment onward, Mr. Bella discovered an aversion to bright sunlight and an unquenchable thirst for fresh blood. He became a timeless warrior, partaking in battles and wars throughout the centuries, from medieval conflicts to the blood-soaked beaches of Normandy during World War II. On D-Day, he stormed the shores alongside mortal soldiers, enduring bullet hits that would have felled any ordinary man. Yet Mr. Bella persisted, surviving where others fell. The horrors of war took their toll, and after witnessing the brutality of humanity for centuries, he yearned for solitude. Post-World War II, Mr. Bella retreated from the chaos of the world, seeking refuge in the decaying home on the Norfolk estate. A recluse, he sustained himself by feeding on the fresh meat procured from the local store. The town remained blissfully unaware of the ancient entity dwelling within their mists, a survivor of centuries, haunted by the echoes of battle and the weight of immortality. In the dimly lit room of his Norfolk estate, Mr. Bella reveled in the haunting strains of a violin concerto, losing himself in the melancholy beauty of the music. The soft glow of the lamplight illuminated his aged face as he sat in a worn leather chair, a timeless figure shrouded in the shadows. As the melodic notes wrapped around him, an unwelcome disturbance resonated through the quietness. The distant rumble of approaching cars along the gravel driveway shattered the serenity, drawing Mr. Bella's attention away from the captivating concerto. A subtle smile curled on his lips as he licked them in anticipation. Rising from his chair, he moved with a quiet purpose towards the front door. Two black Range Rovers rolled to a stop and eight imposing figures emerged, their faces etched with malice. The thug from the store, defiant and arrogant, stood at the forefront. I told you we'd be back, old man, he sneered. Mr. Bella's smile persisted. I'll give you fair warning. None of you will leave this place unless you leave right now. He's the one, the thug bellowed, pointing an accusing finger. The burly men, armed with bats, knives and chains, advanced menacingly. Mr. Bella's expression remained unchanged. With a sudden, fluid motion that defied the laws of physics, Mr. Bella moved faster than the human eye could perceive. His body seemed to transform into a mist, seamlessly traversing the space between one thug and another. One by one, they crumpled to the ground, incapacitated, leaving only the original man standing. For you, this will be long and painful, Mr. Bella whispered, his voice carrying a chilling calmness. I loathe violence, and you have made me have to kill again. For that, you will suffer. As Mr. Bella approached the lone thug, a palpable terror gripped the man. The realization dawned that they had underestimated the enigmatic recluse dwelling in the decaying estate. The night unfolded with an eerie dance of shadows and violence as Mr. Bella, the ancient vampire, prepared to serve a dish of punishment befitting the trespassers who dared disturb his solitude. Over a century had passed since Mr. Bella last tasted the lifeblood of a human, but tonight the ancient vampire indulged in a feast that would rejuvenate his existence. Bodies lay strewn before him, silent witnesses to the macabre banquet. As he drained each life, 
A profound change rippled through him. Youth surged in his veins, transforming his aged frame into a visage of vitality. Air, once white and thin, sprouted anew and turned raven black. The frailty that had characterized his form was replaced by sinewy muscles, and Mr. Bella, now revitalized, exhaled a satisfied breath. Here we go again, he muttered to himself. After the gruesome feast, Mr. Bella disposed of the lifeless bodies with an almost casual detachment. He pushed one of the Range Rovers into the nearby lake, the water swallowing the vehicle in a silent gulp. Climbing into the other car, a wicked smile played on his rejuvenated features. Let's go for a little ride. Following the coordinates on the car's sat navigation system, Mr. Bella drove to a lock-up in West London. Peering through the window, he observed a gathering inside, a motley group of thugs surrounded by burly men, older individuals and a woman, all engaged in tense discussions. Pushing the door open, Mr. Bella walked in, his youthful face unrecognizable to the three thugs from the store. A man barked, Who the hell are you? Let's just say I'm not here for small talk. Mr. Bella replied, the room falling into an uneasy hush. In an instant, his body moved like mist, weaving between the individuals present. One by one, they crumpled to the floor until only the two older men and the woman remained. I take it you are the brains behind these insects, Mr. Bella remarked, his gaze penetrating. I'll give you a choice. Die now, or forget everything of these past days. Either one means nothing to me, so choose wisely. The two old men exchanged glances, defiance flickering in their eyes. You son of a... Before they could finish their sentence, Mr. Bella silenced them with a swift movement. A mist enveloped them, and they fell. Oh well, Mr. Bella muttered, the air heavy with the echoes of his ancient existence. The room bore witness to the consequences of crossing paths with a creature that spanned centuries, a remorseless force of nature that had just awakened from a long slumber. Months had passed since the night of reckoning in West London, and Mr. Bella found himself back at home in Norfolk. Seated in the quiet solitude of his dimly lit room, he immersed himself in the beautiful melodies of the radio as the haunting tunes enveloped him. He rose from his chair only to notice the telltale signs of aging once more. His once muscular frame had withered, and his hair, once vibrant and black, now clung to his scalp in thin grey strands. A wistful smile tugged at the corners of Mr. Bella's lips. Must be getting hungry, he muttered to himself, acknowledging the cyclical nature of his existence. That evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, Mr. Bella's presence chimed through the door of the local shop. The storekeeper, familiar with the enigmatic figure, looked up with a warm smile. Can I resume my order, please? Mr. Bella inquired. Ah, oh, Mr. Bella, good to see you, of course, the storekeeper responded, retrieving the usual supplies. The routine resumed, the exchange of pleasantries, the gathering of fresh meat, and the unspoken understanding that lingered between them. As Mr. Bella stepped back into the night, the air thick with the promise of darkness, he embraced the eternal cycle that defined his existence. The dance between life and death, youth and age, played out in the shadows. The ancient vampire, with the weight of centuries on his shoulders, disappeared into the night, leaving the quaint town of Norfolk to continue its slumber, blissfully unaware of the enigmatic force that traversed its quiet streets. And so, the tale of Mr. Bella the old vampire, unfolded like the pages of an ancient manuscript, 
a story woven with threads of darkness, immortality, and the ceaseless rhythm of a life that spanned across time itself. Ah, my dear nocturnal scholars of the macabre, it's time for a quick scare break. As we linger in these shadowy realms, a small favour I dare to ask. If my tales of terror bring you thrills, do not let our journey end here. Hit like, subscribe, and join our dark congregation. Now shall we delve deeper into the abyss. Let's embrace the darkness once more. Let's get back to the shadows. In the quiet town of Willow Creek, a sinister presence has taken root. As a mysterious vampire named Laura arrives, she begins to weave her web of darkness, luring unsuspecting souls into her clutches. People vanish without a trace, leaving behind only whispers of her insatiable hunger for power. But as ambitions swell, a chilling revelation dawns upon the town. They willingly surrender their minds to her, finding solace in her dark embrace. In a spine-tingling twist, the very one she enslaves begin to hail her as their saviour as she ascends to her throne as the unlikely vampire queen, forever blurring the line between salvation and damnation. The quaint town of Willow Creek had seen its share of newcomers, but none as captivating as Laura Blackwood. Her arrival on a crisp autumn morning caused quite a stir among the townsfolk. A parade of movers carefully unloaded an array of antiques, each piece seemingly more exquisite than the last, into the old Henderson mansion she had recently acquired. The mansion, long abandoned and whispered to be haunted, now buzzed with activity, its once dusty windows gleaming under the touch of the new owner. From a safe distance, Danny Marsh observed the scene unfold. He leaned casually against his battered pickup truck, a half-lit cigarette dangling from his lips. His sharp eyes, a striking shade of blue, missed nothing, especially not the beautiful Laura, who directed the movers with a graceful yet commanding presence. Danny's mind, always scheming, recognised an opportunity. Antiques, he muttered to himself. Each one's got to be worth a fortune. Danny was no stranger to the art of the con. He had drifted into Willow Creek a year ago, charming his way into the hearts and wallets of its unsuspecting residents. His past was a patchwork of aliases and scams, ranging from selling fake vintage wine to posing as a real estate investor. But Laura Blackwood, with her mysterious allure and her trove of treasures, presented a challenge unlike any he had faced. As he watched Laura gracefully navigating her new domain, Danny's mind raced with plans. He knew he needed to get close to her, to gain her trust. His usual charm and smooth talk would be his tools, but he sensed that with Laura, he would need something more. She was different, an enigma wrapped in elegance. Time to turn on the charm, Danny boy. He whispered to himself, flicking the cigarette away and straightening his jacket. He knew the first step was to craft a new persona, one that would appeal to a woman of Laura's taste and class. Danny planned to introduce himself as a local historian, an antique enthusiast, offering to help Laura understand the history of her new home and its previous occupants. It was a perfect cover, one that would grant him access to both the mansion and its owner. As the movers carried the last of the antiques inside, and Laura disappeared behind the heavy oak doors of the Henderson mansion, Danny felt a thrill of excitement. This was more than just a con, it was a game, and Laura Blackwood was an opponent worthy of his skills. But what Danny didn't know was that Laura was not just another wealthy mark. In her, the shadows of the past stirred, and the mansion held secrets far darker than any con he had ever pulled. As the doors of the Henderson mansion closed, 
They didn't just shut out the autumn chill. They sealed Danny's fate, entwining it with the mystery of Laura Blackwood and her haunting collection. Danny took a deep breath before ringing the bell of the Henderson mansion. His reflection in the polished brass door knocker showed a man transformed, a crisp, tailored suit replacing his usual casual attire, a confident smile playing on his lips. He had spent the last few days studying the history of the town and its antiques, preparing himself for this moment. The door swung open, revealing Laura in her enigmatic beauty. She wore a dress that seemed to belong to another era, accentuating her timeless grace. Her dark eyes sparkled with a hint of amusement as she greeted him. Mr. Marsh, is it? She said, her voice a melody that resonated with an accent Danny couldn't place. I'm intrigued by your interest in local history. Hmm. Danny, playing the part of the historian, launched into a rehearsed spiel about the mansion's past. As he spoke, he noticed Laura's expression change subtly. Her smile grew, not in warmth, but in what seemed like amusement. My dear Mr. Marsh, while your efforts are commendable, you are quite mistaken on several accounts. She interjected gracefully, her laughter like chimes in the wind. The Hendersons never owned this mansion in the 1800s. It was built much later. Danny felt a flush of embarrassment. His carefully constructed persona was unraveling before him. He realized, with a mixture of awe and intimidation, that Laura's intelligence far surpassed his own. She was toying with him, a cat with a mouse caught in its paws. However, to Danny's surprise, Laura's amusement didn't seem malicious. You're quite the character, Mr. Marsh. I admire your determination. Would you care to join me for dinner? I have a few tales about the mansion that might interest you. Danny, his ego bruised, but still in the game, accepted her invitation. He couldn't shake the feeling of being outmatched, yet the thrill of the challenge egged him on. As he followed her into the dining room, he couldn't help but marvel at the grandeur surrounding him. The room was a treasure trove of antiques each piece whispering of a bygone era. Over dinner, Laura spoke of the mansion's history with an intimacy that suggested first-hand experience. Her knowledge was vast, covering not just the building, but the intricate details of the periods the antiques came from. Danny, usually so confident in his charm, found himself listening more than speaking, mesmerized by her stories. As the evening drew to a close, Danny realized he had underestimated Laura. She was no ordinary mark. She was a puzzle, complex and fascinating. He thanked her for the dinner, a genuine sense of respect, mingling with his usual facade of charm. I look forward to our next meeting, Mr. Marsh, Laura said with a knowing smile, her eyes gleaming in the candlelight. As Danny stepped out into the cool night air, he felt a mixture of excitement and trepidation. He had walked into the Henderson mansion as the hunter, but as he left, he couldn't shake the feeling that he might be the one ensnared in a game far beyond his understanding. The shadows of the mansion seemed to laugh at him, whispering secrets he was yet to uncover. The tranquility of Willow Creek was shattered by the news that spread like wildfire through its streets. Two boys, both around 10 years old, had gone missing. Panic and fear gripped the heart of the town as parents held their children a little tighter and neighbors eyed each other with suspicion. The local police, a small force unaccustomed to such events, were under immense pressure to find the boys. Rumors swirled some pointing fingers at strangers seen in town, others whispering about old legends and curses. Amidst this chaos, Laura Blackwood, the mysterious new resident of the Henderson mansion, became a subject of speculation. Her arrival coincided with the unsettling event, and in small towns, newcomers often bore the brunt of suspicion. It wasn't long before the police, following protocol more than actual suspicion, knocked on the door of the mansion. 
Laura greeted them with her usual poise, a hint of curiosity in her eyes. Good evening, officers. To what do I owe the pleasure? She asked, her voice calm and controlled. Miss Blackwood, we're conducting inquiries regarding the two boys who've gone missing. We're speaking to everyone in the area. One of the officers explained, his discomfort in her presence evident. Laura raised an eyebrow, a faint smile on her lips. I see. And you suspect me, a lone woman who has barely settled in, a foul play. Is this a customary welcome for new residents in Willow Creek? The officers exchanged glances, their unease growing. No, ma'am. It's just standard procedure. We have to check with everyone. Laura's gaze seemed to pierce through them, her intellect cast in a shadow that made the officers feel out of their depth. Well, officers, I assure you I have no information about the missing children. Perhaps your time would be better spent searching rather than questioning those who have nothing to hide. The police, realising that they would glean nothing from this interaction, thanked her and left, feeling somehow that they had been dismissed rather than concluding their questioning. After the door closed behind them, Laura's expression turned cold. She descended into the cellar of the mansion, a place where the antiques were older and the air hung heavy with secrets. There, in the dim light, lay the bodies of the two boys, their faces peaceful in eternal slumber. Laura looked down at them, a predatory glint in her eyes. Enough food for the next couple of days, she murmured to herself. The boys, now part of the mansion's dark history, were a testament to her survival. A survival that had spanned centuries, feeding on the unsuspecting and the lost. The cellar, with its stone walls and shadowed corners, held more than just wine and antiques. It was a sanctuary for Laura, a place where she could embrace her true nature away from the prying eyes of the world above. As she prepared her grim feast, the mansion above stood silent, guarding its mistress and her ancient secrets. Danny returned to the Henderson mansion with a mix of trepidation and intrigue. The previous night's encounter with Laura had left him feeling both outwitted and captivated. He knocked on the massive door, his mind racing with questions about the enigmatic woman who lived within. Laura greeted him with a smile that didn't quite reach her eyes. Mr. Marsh, what a pleasant surprise. Do come in. As Danny stepped into the foyer, he sensed a change in the atmosphere. The mansion seemed more imposing, and Laura's presence more commanding. He followed her into the drawing room, unaware that he was walking into a trap carefully laid by centuries of cunning. Laura. About the other night, Danny began, but Laura raised a hand to silence him. Mr. Marsh, I have a proposition for you, she said, her voice smooth like silk. I find myself in need of a, let's call it a personal assistant, someone to manage my affairs and ensure my privacy. I believe you could be quite suitable for the role. Danny, surprised by the offer, hesitated. I'm not sure that's my kind of work, Laura. Oh, but I insist, Laura replied, her eyes locking onto his. It was then that Danny felt a strange sensation, as if his will was being siphoned away. Laura's gaze held him captive, and he found himself unable to look away. Laura's voice became a hypnotic melody, weaving around Danny, penetrating his thoughts. You will serve me, Danny. Your life as you know it is over. You belong to me now. Danny tried to resist, but it was like fighting a tidal wave with his bare hands. He felt his identity, his ambitions, even his cunning being drowned in the depths of Laura's will. She was binding him to her, turning him into a servant, bound by an invisible, unbreakable chain. When the process was complete, Danny stood before Laura, his eyes empty of the rebellion and scheming that once filled them. He was now her dedicated servant, a puppet whose strings were firmly in Laura's hands. Good, 
Laura said with satisfaction. Now we must attend to certain needs of mine. You will help me, Danny. You will bring me what I require. Laura explained her true nature to the now submissive Danny. She was a vampire, an immortal predator who fed on human blood. Danny, as her servant, would be responsible for luring unsuspecting victims to the mansion. She promised him eternal servitude in return for his obedience, a twisted reward for a life spent conning others. Danny, devoid of his own will, accepted his new role without question. He became an extension of Laura's desires, a tool she wielded with precision. The Henderson Mansion, once a symbol of mystery and allure, now harbored a dark alliance between predator and unwilling prey. As the sun set over Willow Creek, casting long shadows across the town, Danny stepped out into the night on his first errand for his new mistress. The roles had been reversed. The con man was now the slave, bound to serve the whims of an ancient and merciless vampire. The discovery of the boy's bodies in the lake sent shockwaves through Willow Creek. The town, already on edge from their disappearance, plunged into a state of collective panic and fear. The police, upon examining the bodies, found them drained of blood, with small, precise puncture wounds on their necks. This eerie detail unleashed a torrent of whispers and superstitions among the townspeople, with talk of dark, ancient entities that lurked in the shadows. Danny, under Laura's control, had been the one to dispose of the bodies. His once familiar features now bore a gaunt, haunted look. His movements mechanical and devoid of the charm he was known for. This drastic change did not go unnoticed. Murmurs began to spread, linking Danny's altered demeanor and appearance with the sinister events unfolding in Willow Creek. The situation escalated when a local farmhand known for his punctuality and dedication, mysteriously vanished. He had been due to tend to livestock at a nearby farm, but never showed up. His disappearance added fuel to the fire of rumors and accusations that were beginning to spiral out of control. The townspeople, gripped by fear and suspicion, started pointing fingers. Some mentioned the Henderson Mansion and its enigmatic new resident, Others recalled the legends of the old mansion and its supposed curse. But a growing number of eyes turned towards Danny, the once charming stranger who now seemed like a different person. Whispers turned into open discussions at the local diner, the post office and on the streets. People recounted old stories of vampires and creatures of the night, tales they had dismissed as mere folklore. Now these stories took on a new, terrifying relevance. The Henderson Mansion has always been bad news. One local was overheard saying at the diner, and that Danny, have you seen him lately? Looks like a ghost he does. Something's not right there. Another chimed in, and those poor boys drained of blood, they said. It's like something out of a horror book. We've never had such things happen here before. Fear turned into paranoia, and paranoia bred suspicion. The town's once friendly and trusting atmosphere began to crumble. Neighbors eyed each other warily, and the streets grew quiet as night fell. People locked their doors and windows, casting nervous glances towards the looming silhouette of the Henderson Mansion against the night sky. In the mansion, Laura watched the chaos unfold in the town below with a cold detachment. The fear and turmoil were inconsequential to her, mere ripples on the surface of her eternal existence. But for Danny, trapped in servitude, the whispers and accusations of the townsfolk were a distant echo of a life he could no longer claim as his own. He was a pawn in a game played by a creature as old as time, and the stakes were higher than he could have ever imagined. As days passed, a mysterious sickness enveloped Willow Creek. The once bustling streets became eerily quiet, with the townspeople afflicted by an unexplained weakness and fatigue. They moved lethargically, 
like shadows of their former selves, drained of vitality and spirit. The local clinic was overwhelmed, yet no diagnosis could be found for this sudden plague that seemed to sap the life from its victims. Amidst this growing crisis, another person went missing. Mrs. Henderson, the local librarian. Known for her vibrant personality and love for community events, her disappearance added a new layer of fear to the already panicked town. Mrs. Henderson, last seen heading towards the Henderson mansion for a book donation, never returned home. The town, once a picture of rural charm and close-knit community, now resembled a ghost town. Only a few people, those still clinging to some semblance of strength, could be seen shuffling around. The once cheerful conversations at the diner and the laughter of children playing in the park were now distant memories. In stark contrast to the town's despair, the Henderson mansion seemed to pulse with an unnatural energy and life. Within its walls, Laura presided over her growing vampire family, the two boys, the farmhand, and two new members. A young couple who had recently moved to Willow Creek sat around her, their eyes glowing with the same crimson hue as hers. The mansion was alive with the sounds of their new existence, the soft whispers of plotting, the gentle rustle of movement, and the occasional low laughter. The antique-filled rooms, once silent and brooding, now echoed with the presence of the undead. Laura looked upon her new family with a sense of accomplishment. It's just like old times, she murmured, a smile curling her lips. The memories of her lost family, once a source of pain, were now being replaced by this new assembly of creatures bound to her will. Outside, the moon cast a pale light over the withering town, its glow seemingly absorbed by the darkened windows of the mansion. The residents of Willow Creek, unaware of the true source of their malaise, continued to succumb to the strange sickness. Unbeknownst to them, it was the work of Laura's expanding brood who ventured out under the cover of night to feed, leaving their victims alive but drained of vitality. In the mansion, plans were being made. Laura, with centuries of cunning and strategy, plotted the next steps for her family. They would need to be careful, to feed without drawing too much attention, to grow in strength without revealing their existence. But for now, they reveled in their newfound power, the mansion a beacon of dark life in the midst of a dying town. The future was uncertain, but under Laura's guidance, they were ready to face whatever challenges came their way. The night was theirs, and they would make the most of it. Inside the dimly lit grandeur of the Henderson mansion, Laura's impatience was palpable. She paced the room like a caged animal, her elegant demeanor giving way to a more primal nature. Danny, standing obediently at the edge of the room, watched her with lifeless eyes. You are proving quite useless, Danny, Laura snapped, her voice a mix of irritation and hunger. I require sustenance, more than what you've been providing. Do you wish for me to starve? Danny remained silent his will entirely subjugated to her demands. The transformation from a cunning con man to a docile servant was complete. Outside, the town of Willow Creek was in turmoil. The day had dawned with heavy hearts as families prepared to lay the two young boys to rest. But a new horror unfolded when it was discovered that the boys' bodies were missing from their coffins. Grief turned to chaos with distraught families and a bewildered community grappling with this unfathomable turn of events. Meanwhile, in the shadowed depths of the mansion's cellar, a sinister transformation was taking place. The two boys, thought to be lost forever, stirred. Their eyes opened, revealing a haunting crimson glow. They were no longer the children they had been. They were now fledgling vampires reborn into darkness under Laura's malevolent influence. Laura descended the stairs, her eyes gleaming with a mixture of triumph and a twisted maternal pride. 
Welcome to my family, my children. She cooed, observing the confused and frightened boys. Danny, witnessing the scene, showed no reaction. The horror of what was unfolding before him was lost to his ensnared mind. Now, Danny, Laura turned her attention back to her servant. You must provide for three. Soon, we shall have a full house again. Her voice held a hint of nostalgia and a trace of cruelty. As Laura spoke, her mind wandered back to a time long past, a memory that she had kept hidden in the darkest corners of her existence. She remembered a grand house filled with laughter and the night air echoing with the playful calls of her vampire family. But that joy was shattered one fateful night when vampire hunters, armed with stakes and holy water, descended upon them. The memory of fire, screams, and the bitter smell of betrayal filled her senses. Laura had survived, using her cunning and ruthlessness to outwit the hunters. She escaped into the night, leaving behind the smoldering ruins of her family. That loss had hardened her, turning her into the remorseless creature she was today. Back in the present, Laura's gaze fell upon Danny and the two new vampires. You must learn quickly, she said to the boys. The world is cruel, and we must be crueler to survive. As night fell over Willow Creek, the town remained unaware of the growing darkness within the Henderson mansion, a darkness that was preparing to spread its shadows with Laura at its heart and Danny as its unwilling harbinger. The desolate streets of Willow Creek echoed with the sound of footsteps as Laura, accompanied by the ghostly figure of Danny, emerged from the mansion. Danny, once full of life and cunning, now walked beside her as a living corpse, a testament to Laura's power and ruthlessness. As they passed, the few remaining townsfolk peeked through their curtains, their eyes widening in fear and disbelief. Laura, a figure of elegance and terror, strode confidently towards the town hall. The building, usually a hub of community activity, was now a shelter for the few remaining villagers, the police force, the mayor, and some key figures of the town. Inside, a heated meeting was underway. Voices were raised in frustration and fear, discussing plans to combat the mysterious sickness and the recent disappearances. The town was on the brink of collapse, and desperation filled the air. The doors of the town hall burst open, silencing the room instantly. Laura stepped in, her presence commanding and chilling. Danny followed, his dead eyes scanning the room. I have come to help, Laura announced, her voice resonating with an authority that demanded attention. Who is in charge here? She asked her gaze sweeping over the stunned faces. The mayor, a middle-aged man with a look of bewilderment, stood up. I am, he declared, trying to muster his authority. In a blur of movement, Laura lunged at him, knocking him down with ease. The room gasped in shock as she stood over the mayor, her figure dominating the space. Now who is in charge? She asked again, her voice cold and unyielding. The room remained silent, the realization dawning on them that the power dynamics had shifted irrevocably. Laura addressed the room, her plan unfolding with each word. You are all now servants of mine, she declared. Your town has been draining its citizens of their lives through taxation and laws that cannot be obeyed. I, on the other hand, am a fair ruler I will take only what I need. The townsfolk, the police, and the officials looked at each other in horror and disbelief. Laura's declaration was unfathomable, yet the evidence of her power was unmistakable. I will restore order to this town, Laura continued. In return, you will provide me and my family with what we require. Refuse, and you will face consequences far worse than any law or tax. The room, now a mix of fear and reluctant acceptance, 
nodded in agreement. Laura's rule was now the law of the land, and resistance seemed futile. As Laura and Danny left the town hall, the remaining townsfolk began to understand the gravity of their new reality. Willow Creek, once a peaceful and vibrant community, was now under the control of an ancient and merciless vampire. Their lives, their town, their very existence were now at the mercy of Laura and her dark family. The night had fallen on Willow Creek, and with it, a new era had begun, an era of shadows and servitude. Months had passed since Laura had taken control of Willow Creek. Under her rule, the town had seen a strange kind of prosperity. The mysterious sickness had ceased, and the townspeople were allowed to keep what they earned. The only tribute Laura demanded was a fresh supply of blood each day, a tax paid in life rather than coin. The town, though under the shadow of vampiric rule, had adapted to this new normal, but the peace was not to last. Word of the changes in Willow Creek had spread beyond its borders, catching the attention of a group of vampire hunters. Seasoned and relentless, they arrived in town, driven by tales of a vampire who had taken an entire town under her thrall. Laura, sensing their arrival, stood at the window of her mansion, watching the night. Oh, revenge, she whispered to herself. To her, these hunters were no different from the ones who had destroyed her family over a century ago. Time held little meaning for her. All humans were the same, either food or servants. The vampire hunters gathered in an abandoned warehouse away from the prying eyes of the townspeople. They were a diverse group, each with their own reasons for pursuing the undead. Some sought vengeance for loved ones lost. Others were driven by a sense of duty to eradicate the vampire threat, and a few were motivated by the thrill of the hunt. They laid out their weapons, stakes, crosses, holy water, and garlic. They discussed strategies and shared knowledge of vampire lore. Each hunter knew the risks involved in confronting a vampire as old and powerful as Laura, but their resolve was unshaken. The hunters planned to assault the mansion at dawn when they believed Laura and her brood would be weakest. They split into teams, each with a specific role. Some would infiltrate the mansion to find and destroy the vampires while others would set traps and secure the perimeter to prevent any escape. As the hunters prepared for the impending assault, the town of Willow Creek slept uneasily, unaware of the storm that was about to break. Inside the mansion, Laura gathered her family, briefing them on the hunters' presence and their likely plan of attack. We shall meet their aggression with our own, Laura said, her eyes burning with a fierce determination. They seek to destroy us, but they will find that we are not so easily vanquished. The vampire family readied themselves for the confrontation, each aware of the stakes. They were fighting not just for survival, but for the dominion they had established over Willow Creek. As the first light of dawn touched the horizon, the hunters made their move, advancing towards the mansion with weapons drawn and hearts steeled for battle. The final confrontation between the ancient vampire and the hunters was about to begin, and with it, the fate of Willow Creek hung in the balance. As the first light of dawn seeped through the windows of the Henderson Mansion, the first wave of vampire hunters burst through the doors. They moved with precision and determination, a well-oiled machine of destruction. They encountered members of Laura's vampire family in the corridors, engaging in a fierce battle. Despite the vampire's strength and agility, the hunters managed to overpower two of them, pinning them down to drive stakes through their hearts. The vampires crumbled into dust, their immortal lives extinguished. The hunters advanced to the main room, where Laura sat waiting, an air of calm defiance about her. 
Welcome, insects. She greeted them with a mocking sneer. As the hunters charged, Laura rose from her chair. Her movements were a blur, a dance of death uh, that no human eye could follow. She was no ordinary vampire. Her speed was unearthly, her power beyond comprehension. Within seconds, the hunters lay strewn across the floor, their lives snuffed out by Laura's merciless hands. Alerted by the commotion, the second wave of hunters stormed into the mansion. They found Laura seated once again, her eyes glowing with dark amusement. As they prepared to attack, Laura whispered an ancient mantra, her voice weaving a spell of old and forbidden magic. The bodies of the fallen hunters began to twitch and convulse, rising to their feet. The eyes that opened were no longer human, but glowed with a sinister light. The dead hunters turned on their living comrades, engaging them in a brutal and chaotic battle. The mansion's grand room turned into a war zone, with Hunter fighting Hunter and Laura watching from her throne-like chair. The sound of combat filled the air, the clash of weapons, the snarls of the undead, and the cries of the dying. When the dust settled, only two hunters remained, battered and bloodied, standing amidst the carnage. They looked up at Laura, their eyes filled with a mix of horror and resignation. Welcome to the family, Laura said, her voice dripping with a sinister warmth before they could react. She was upon them, her fangs sinking into their necks. Their struggles weakened as Laura's venom worked its transformation. When she released them, they were changed, no longer hunters, but members of her vampire family. Their eyes glowed with the same crimson hue as hers, their humanity lost to the dark gift of vampirism. The Henderson Mansion, once a symbol of horror and oppression, had withstood the assault of the hunters. Laura, more powerful than ever, stood at the heart of her growing family. The town of Willow Creek, still oblivious to the true nature of its ruler, continued its uneasy existence under her shadow. Laura looked out from her mansion, her gaze sweeping over the town. She had defended her domain, expanded her family, and the night was still hers to command. The world outside remained unaware of the dark power that resided within the walls of the Henderson mansion, a power that had once again proven itself to be both formidable and unyielding. As the seasons changed, so too did the town of Willow Creek under Laura's rule. The once fearful and oppressed community began to flourish in a way that was unprecedented. Without the burden of taxes and fines imposed by traditional human governance, the residents kept the entirety of their earnings. This financial liberation brought a wave of prosperity and innovation to the town. Crime became virtually non-existent. Any disputes or conflicts among the townspeople were brought before Laura. Her judgments were swift and fair, not swayed by personal gain or favoritism. She ruled with an iron fist, but also with a surprising sense of justice. Her only demand was the tribute of blood, a price the townspeople had come to accept as the cost of their newfound prosperity. Businesses thrived as they no longer faced the crippling weight of taxes. The local farmer's market blossomed into a bustling hub of trade, attracting vendors and customers from neighboring areas. The schools, funded generously by the town's newfound wealth, offered a level of education that was the envy of surrounding communities. The arts flourished as well, with musicians, painters, and writers finding in Willow Creek a haven of creative freedom and support. The town, once a mere speck on the map, became a cultural hotspot. Its galleries and theatres a testament to the renaissance it was experiencing. News of Willow Creek's transformation spread far and wide, becoming a topic of discussion in towns and cities struggling under the weight of economic hardship. It wasn't long before a visitor from a neighbouring town, burdened by heavy taxation and stifling laws, arrived at Laura's doorstep. The visitor, 
a representative of his community, had come with a plea. They had heard of the prosperity and peace in Willow Creek and wanted Laura to extend her rule over their town. They spoke of the crippling taxes that left their families in poverty and the laws that hindered their growth. Laura listened, her eyes gleaming with a mix of interest and calculation. She saw an opportunity to expand her domain, not through force or fear, but through an offer of a better life. She agreed to their request, with the same terms she had imposed on Willow Creek, absolute loyalty and the nightly tribute. Soon, other towns followed suit, drawn by the promise of prosperity and freedom from the shackles of traditional governance. Laura's region grew, encompassing a swath of territory where she was the undisputed ruler. Her demands remained consistent, fair rule in exchange for the blood tribute. Under her reign, the region experienced a golden age of sorts. The streets were safe, the people were free from economic burden, and justice was served impartially. Laura, once a feared vampire, had become an unlikely symbol of hope and progress. Yet, beneath the veneer of this utopia, there was an unspoken understanding. Laura's rule, while benevolent in many ways, was absolute. Her word was law, and her wrath, though rarely seen, was something to be feared. The townsfolk lived with the knowledge that their prosperity came at a price. A price paid in the shadows, where the vampire family fed, ensuring the, the continuation of their dark legacy. Laura's influence, which began in the small town of Willow Creek, started to ripple outwards, reaching the higher echelons of the country's politics. Her reputation as a fair and effective ruler in her region had caught the attention of the nation. People, tired of the inefficiencies and corruption often associated with traditional politics, began to see Laura as a symbol of change and efficiency. Laura's ascent in the political arena was as strategic as it was swift. Using her centuries of knowledge and understanding of human nature, she began to build alliances with key political figures. Her offers were always enticing. Support for policies that would genuinely benefit the public in exchange for their loyalty. Those who opposed her found themselves outmaneuvered at every turn. Laura's tactics were subtle and often indirect, but always effective. Her opponents found their careers dwindling as scandals mysteriously came to light, or key supporters suddenly changed allegiances. At the same time, Laura implemented policies in her region that were revolutionary. She introduced social welfare programs that eradicated poverty, established healthcare systems that were the envy of neighboring states, and funded educational initiatives that produced remarkable results. Crime rates plummeted under her strict but fair governance, and the economy flourished as businesses thrived without oppressive taxes. Word of her successes spread, painting her as a maverick politician who genuinely cared for the people. This public image was bolstered by her enigmatic charisma, making her a popular figure among the masses. The media, too, were captivated by this new, dynamic leader who seemed to be bringing about real change. As Laura's fame grew, she was eventually invited to play a more significant role in the national government. Her policies, proven effective in her region, began to be implemented on a larger scale. She advocated for reforms that cut down on governmental waste, fought against corruption, and promoted transparency in politics. However, behind the scenes, Laura's methods were not always as benevolent as they seemed. Her network of vampires, loyal only to her, worked in the shadows. They gathered information, influenced key decisions, and ensured that Laura's will was carried out. Her rule, though seemingly democratic, was underpinned by a subtle manipulation that only she could orchestrate. 
Under Laura's guidance, the country underwent a transformation. The economy was revitalized, public trust in the government was restored, and the quality of life for the average citizen improved dramatically. Yet, in the quiet of the night, Laura's true nature prevailed. The tribute of blood continued, a dark reminder that her benevolent rule came at a hidden cost. Laura had become a paradox, a vampire matriarch who was both feared and revered. To the public, she was a saving grace, a politician who was making their lives better. But to those who knew her true nature, she was a reminder that power could come from the most unlikely and darkest of sources. Her reign marked a new era, one where the lines between good and evil, benevolence and malevolence, were blurred under the rule of an immortal being whose intentions were as complex as her very existence. Laura's rise to power, which began in the quaint town of Willow Creek, culminated in her unprecedented ascent to the highest political office. Election after election, her influence and popularity grew, as did the belief in her vision for a better future. Her policies, once confined to her region, had proven so effective that they became a blueprint for national prosperity. The public, seeing the tangible improvements in their lives, rallied behind her, propelling her to victory in each electoral contest. When Laura won the presidency, it was a landslide victory, a testament to her widespread appeal and the deep-rooted desire for change among the citizens. However, Laura had grander plans than merely being a president. She intended to transform the role, and in doing so, the very structure of governance. In a bold move, Laura proposed a radical restructuring of the political system arguing that the traditional model of democracy was inefficient and often mired in bureaucracy. She advocated for a more streamlined form of governance with a singular visionary leader at the helm. Her charisma and proven track record swayed public opinion and through a series of referendums and legislative changes, Laura's position evolved from that of a president to a monarch. Thus. Laura became the queen, a ruler with unparalleled authority and influence. The title was symbolic of her role as the protector and guide of the nation, and it resonated with the people who saw her as a regal and benevolent figure. Under Queen Laura's rule, the country transformed into a utopia. Each state, city and town was overseen by one of her vampires each chosen for their loyalty and ability to carry out her will. These vampire governors maintained order, ensured justice, and implemented Laura's policies with unwavering dedication. The nation flourished like never before. Poverty was eradicated, crime rates dropped to historic lows, and education and healthcare systems became models for the world, driven by innovation and a spirit of communal cooperation. The arts and sciences thrived, leading to a renaissance of culture and knowledge. Queen Laura, sitting upon her throne, was the architect of this golden age. Her vision had brought about an era of peace and prosperity, but at its core, it was a kingdom built upon a secret pact. The nightly tribute of blood continued, a dark undercurrent to the utopian society she had created it was a price the vampires collected discreetly, maintaining the illusion of a perfect nation. The world looked on in awe and envy at the nation under the vampire queen's rule. Diplomatic relations and international policies were handled with the same cunning and foresight that had characterized Laura's rise to power. Other countries sought to emulate her model, seeing the results but unaware of the true nature of her reign. Laura, now the most powerful ruler in the world, presided over her kingdom with a blend of magnanimity and iron control. Her reign was a paradox, a beacon of progress and enlightenment, shadowed by the ancient primal pact that sustained her and her kind. The vampire queen 
once a creature lurking in the shadows, now sat in the light, her throne a symbol of a new world order. Her rule was a testament to the complex tapestry of human and inhuman ambition, where the lines between benevolence and tyranny, mortality and immortality, were forever blurred. The world had changed under her reign, and the future, though bright, held within it the indelible mark of the night and the enigmatic will of the Vampire Queen. We begin our tale with Jonathan Harker, an English solicitor sent to Dracula's castle to assist with the purchase of an estate in England. The journey to the castle was eerie, with wolves howling in the distance and a thick fog enveloping the mountain pass. As Harker arrived, he was greeted by the imposing figure of Count Dracula whose aristocratic charm thinly veiled an unsettling aura. As days passed within the castle's darkened halls, Harker discovered the true nature of his host, Dracula, with his sharp fangs and hypnotic gaze, revealed himself as a nocturnal predator, a creature of the night who fed on the blood of the living. Harker became a prisoner in this macabre fortress, his fear escalating with each encounter with the supernatural. Back in England, Harker's fiancée Mina awaited his return. Unbeknownst to her, a series of bizarre and terrifying events unfolded. A ghostly ship, the Demeter, washed ashore with its crew mysteriously missing as Harker struggled for his life in Transylvania. Dracula embarked on a perilous journey to England aboard this cursed vessel. Dracula's arrival in England marked the beginning of a reign of terror. His ability to transform into a bat or a wolf allowed him to move undetected through the shadows preying on the unsuspecting citizens of London. The city became a battleground between the forces of darkness and those determined to thwart the malevolent Count. Professor Abraham Van Helsing emerged as the leader of the resistance against Dracula. Armed with knowledge of ancient folklore and a steadfast belief in the supernatural, Van Helsing rallied a group of unlikely heroes. Mina now reunited with her fiancé, Jonathan Harker, and her friend, Lucy Westenra, who had fallen victim to Dracula's insidious bite, joined the fight against the Vampire Lord. The confrontation between Dracula and the Vampire Hunters intensified as the Count sought to take Mina, his eternal bride. Battle accumulated in a spine-chilling chase through the darkened streets of London with Dracula's unearthly powers pitted against the sheer determination of his adversaries. As the sun began to rise, casting its golden rays over the horizon, the hunters cornered Dracula in the heart of the city. Van Helsing, wielding a wooden stake, confronted the ancient evil the final showdown unfolded in a crescendo of horror, with the Count's monstrous form contorting in agony as a stake pierced his heart. With Dracula defeated, a sense of relief washed over the city. The survivors emerged from the shadows, haunted by the lingering memories of the supernatural terror they had faced. The tale of Count Dracula became a cautionary legend, a reminder that evil could manifest in the most unexpected and monstrous forms, lurking just beyond the veil of the everyday world. Though the immediate threat had been vanquished, the legacy of Dracula endured, casting a long, chilling shadow over the collective consciousness. And if you're still looking to fulfill your thirst for more horror, don't forget to check out this next video 
Unless, of course, you are frozen with fear already.